So, today's lecture is going to be on the organization of immunoglobulin genes and the mechanism of gene rearrangement. Now, the title itself will tell you that there is something rather special about these immunoglobulin genes as compared to other genes of our system. Now, what is the difference? Now, let us go back to looking at the B cells themselves. We know that we have countless number of receptors or antigen receptors which can recognize a countless number of antigens. Not only antigens, let us be a little bit more spe specific, epitopes on antigens. It is estimated that we are capable of recognizing about a hundred million different epitopic sequences by the B cell antigen receptor. What is shown here is six different B cells. Now, though they have been depicted here as different colors, we know that all B cells are morphologically very similar. They have also similar receptors on the cell surface. All of them have antigen receptors which also look very similar. We also know that each one of these cell is capable of recognizing different antigen and it is this that triggers the activation process which is what we dealt with in the last lecture and clonal proliferation. We also know that such a cascade of proliferation results in the generation of anti producing plasma cells as well as a few memory cells. Now, how is it that in this what is represented here in this cartoon only one that is cell number 4 reacts with its cognate antigen and it undergoes proliferation whereas, the others are bystanders. This can only be because of the specificity with which only clone number 4 is capable of recognizing the antigen. So, we have a vast diversity of antibody specificities like I said earlier, we are capable of recognizing and mounting an immune response to 100 million different antigens. Intriguingly, the same molecule you know the antigen receptor has a highly variable region at the amino terminus you know that the terminus with through which it recognizes the antigen. Yet, two thirds of the same molecule it is very constant. So, if you can go back to the previous slide, we can see that two thirds of this receptor which is present on each of these B cell is identical. It is only at the amino terminus a small fragment which is highly variable. The other intriguing part is that the same antigenic specificity can be conferred on different isotypes of immunoglobulin. Now, I have not yet introduced the class and isotypes of immunoglobulin molecule, but it is something that you may have studied already that we in mammals have five different classes of immunoglobulins. Now, ideally one would have only IgM production in the primary phase of the immune response. Now, the same IgM starts to get switched to another isotype, but the specificity of binding to the antigen remains same. So, how is it that there are existence of different isotypes, but with the same antigenic specificity. Now, to answer the question how is it that we are capable of recognizing such diverse antigens, how is it that immunoglobulin molecule is very variable at one region, yet very constant on the other region. To answer this there were two theories that were proposed about 50 years ago. One was the germline theory and the other one somatic hypermutation. Now, the germline theory proposed that we in fact do have that many number of genes which correspond to a hundred million different specificities. This of course, one can imagine can, could not be so, because the body cannot invest in such a large proportion of genes being dedicated only to the immune system 
not only immune system the B cells in specific. So, the second theory that was put forth then was somatic hypermutation. Now, this theory said that all receptors on the B cell surface are identical with the same um, region or sequence at the amino terminus, but it is when such a B cell encounters an antigen that there is hypermutation in the region and there is antigen and receptor interaction, but this also did not hold much water and it was in 1963 that Dreyer and Bennett proposed for the first time that the immunoglobulin is coded for by two different genes. We do know now that is not two different genes, but two different gene segments, one that corresponds to the variable region and the other gene segment to the constant. Now, here I have represented several molecules of immunoglobulin which are identical as you can see with the heavy and the light chain. Two thirds of the molecule is identical which is shown in black and the variability lies only in the amino terminus. Now, you can see that heavy and light chain both of them have variable domains. So, though Dreyer and Bennett proposed in 1963 that there could be two gene segments, well we know gene segments now, code for the immunoglobulin whole molecule. It was in 1976, just 13 years later that Tony Kawa and Hazumi did very elegant experiments to demonstrate that indeed there are different gene segments at the DNA and there is reorganization of the immunoglobulin genes at the DNA level itself. Let us look at the experiment that they carried out. Now, what they did was they have taken DNA from embryonic cells which now represents the germ line. They have then taken a myeloma cell. What is a myeloma? It is a cancer of the plasma cell. Plasma cell just to make you remember that plasma cells are the end stage cell of a B cell. They produce antibodies and as you can see from the picture plasma cell has a very well developed endoplasmic reticulum. So, now they have taken the DNA from the myeloma cell as well as DNA from the embryonic cell. The DNA was then isolated and digested with restriction endonucleases. So, that small fragments were generated. These were then electrophoresed separately. In parallel, mRNA was isolated from the myeloma cell. The RNA, mRNA was labeled with P32 radioactive phosphorus and the mRNA corresponded to the light chain of the immunoglobulin gene. The labeled mRNA was then hybridized to the fragments of the TNA taken from the myeloma cell or the embryonic cell. Now, what they saw always that in case of the myeloma cell, the hybridization happened with a single band whereas, embryonic DNA hybridized with two different bands. What did this suggest? Very easily one can say that the DNA corresponding to the copper light chain is not identical when you compare the myeloma cell, the end cell stage as well as the embryonic. So, there has been a change in the DNA itself when the myeloma cell is established. Chromosomal DNA is no longer identical to the germline DNA and now what did they observe here? That several coding sequences separated by non-coding sequences in the germline DNA are brought together at the DNA level in the B cell. I have tried to put this in the form of a diagram which says now the embryonic DNA is much longer and by deletion of some segments. Now, in this particular case several segments including this one are deleted and the myeloma DNA in the immunoglobulin kappa chain 
is smaller than the embryonic DNA. Now, this was the first report and for this in fact, Tonegawa got the Nobel Prize several years later. Now, this was really a remarkable experiment. Now, the reason why people were not able to demonstrate this earlier just because of lack of appropriate technology. So, as soon as technology became available, molecular biology um, technologies became available, it was possible for people to do experiments to demonstrate that there is rearrangement in the immunoglobulin gene in the B cell. Now, the similar event happens also in the T cells and you will probably hear about it in another class. Now, after this first report of Tonegawa and Hazumi, several gene sequences of the immunoglobulin genes were revealed. And now, I am going to show you typically the gene reorganization in the kappa light chain gene and then also the heavy light, heavy gene. Now, let us look at the germ line kappa chain, which has not undergone rearrangement. Now, as you can see that there are two sets of sequences here in the variable domain, one that is shown in red here, which is called V k variable kappa. Now, there are three segments that have been shown here V k 1, V k 2, V k 3. Now, these are separated by a set of sequences here, gene segments rather, which are known as J sequence. Now, after the J sequences is the constant region. Now, you all might remember that kappa or the light chain is much smaller and has only one constant domain. Now, every V gene segment is separated by introns from the other V gene segments and separated by a large stretch from the J gene segments. On the 5 prime side of every V gene segment, there is a L segment or the leader peptide segment. Any one of the J can join with any one of the V. There is a slide that is going to depict later on how many V gene segments we have well, how many we have and how many mice have. Most of the studies that have been carried out by immunologists have been carried out in mice because mouse is a good model and almost whatever is true of mouse is true of humans as well. Now, like I said, there is a random process and any one of the J can join with any one of the V. So, this happens at the DNA level. I would like to keep on saying that the rearrangement is happening at the DNA level. And what is shown here is V segment 2 joins with J segment 4. This is the rearranged kappa chain DNA. When transcription takes place and the primary RNA transcript is formed, then you have still J5 which is in position, but which gets deleted when the mature mRNA is made this V gene, the variable gene segment which is formed by 1 V and 1 J is what gets associated with the kappa, uh, sorry the constant kappa. Then you have the nascent polypeptide and you have the now kappa light chain which is either cell surface exposed or is a part of the antibody. You can see the absence of the leader sequence. Now, the leader sequence is required because immunoglobulin is a secretory protein and it goes through the transport from the ribosomes to the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi and that and then by vesicular transport to the cell surface or gets secreted. The heavy chain is more complicated as one can imagine. First of all, let us look at the constant domain. Kappa chain had only one constant domain the heavy chain has several, each one corresponding to the constant domain of the classes of immunoglobulin M, D, 
IgG3, IgG1, IgG2b, IgG2a. Then immunoglobulin E and immunoglobulin A. All of these have a very specific orientation. These are separated by the variable region by inter intervening sequences. Now, what people found, you know, the light chains of course, were easier to sequence. It was later when people started looking at the heavy chain, they found that four amino acids found in the variable region of the heavy chain could not be counted for by sequences from the V or the J. So, when they looked closely, they found the presence of yet another segment which contributed to the hypervariable region. This is the D gene segment. Now, any one of the J in case of the heavy chain joins with any one of the D gene segments, these then recruit any one of the V gene set. Just like in case of the light chain, the way these gene segments are number are uh, called are V H for variable heavy 1, variable heavy 2 and so on and the number could be 300 to 1000. The D gene segments are fewer, these could be 7 to 13 and then lastly the J gene segment. Like I said a little while ago, first the joining in case of the heavy chain happens between any one of the J yellow with any one of the D green. Once these are recruited, then they recruit any one of the V. The joining takes place at the DNA level itself, rearranged heavy chain. And when this is gene is transcribed, then you have the primary RNA transcript that associates the variable domain with the constant mu corresponding to m and co or constant delta corresponding to d. Heavy chain reorganization is such that simultaneously the cell can produce both kappa sorry both heavy as well as light chain corresponding to the mu or the IgM as well as the IgD. Now, how this happens is something I will come to a little later. The heavy chain gene is even more complex than what I just mentioned because what we have dealt with is mostly the variable domain, but let us look at the constant domain a little bit clo more closely. I have not yet described to you the immunoglobulin structure, but I would just like to mention here that the constant domain of the immunoglobulin are made up of, of several constant domain called 1, 2, 3, 4 in case of IgM and 1, 2 and 3 in case of the IgD. Each of these domains is coded for by a distinct gene segment. So, not only do you have the constant domain as such which is what was shown in the previous slide, but you also have smaller fragments thereof. Now, why is this necessary for me to explain is when we you will appreciate this when we come to the structure of the immunoglobulin. Now, because you also have now a complexity with regard to the antigen receptor being different from the immunoglobulin being secreted. In case of the receptor, the carboxy terminus should have a region which is hydrophobic, so that this gets attached to the membrane. In this is in case of the naive and the memory B cells. Once the cells become plasma cells, then the same domain, the variable domain and the constant domain should now associate with a small fragment in the carboxy terminus, which is which corresponds to the secretory part, which is hydrophilic. So, there are two polyadenylation site 5 prime site, 3 prime site of the last domain of the mu 
which is the fourth one and third in case of the constant domain delta. Now, it is the way the polyadenylation occurs that you will have either mRNA coding for the secreted, secreted mu chain or mRNA coding for the sorry there is a mistake here this should be that should be membrane bound ok this should be membrane. Now, the question comes how is it that we have any one of the J joining with any one of the V. Now, remember the immunoglobulin gene is very almost identical whether the gene the immunoglobulin recognizes antigen A or antigen B. Therefore, the number of amino acids also need to be more or less constant. We also know that though the variable region is hypervariable, the constant domain is more or less the same. Therefore, the immunoglobulin gene cannot accommodate more than one J segment or one V segment or in case of the heavy chain any one V, D and J. So, there has to be a very well regulated event that sees that it is only one of J that is recruited to one of V in case of the light chain gene. Now, this happens because of the presence of recognition signal sequences which are present on the 3 prime site and 5 prime sites of the J and V gene segments. Let us look at what are these recognition signal sequence. In short they are known as RSS. Now, RSS is typically made of first a palindrome sequence CAC, AG, TG. This is you can see very easily a palindrome which is separated by a non anonymer which is AT rich. Now, this heptamer or the palindrome is separated by the nonomer by either 12 base pairs or 22 base pairs. Now, when these two are separated by 12 base pairs, it is known as one turn RSS, one turn recognition signal sequence or when separated by 22, two turn RSS. Now, it is a rule that the segment with one turn RSS joins with two turn RSS. Therefore, now all the V gene segments on the 3 prime side have let us say heptamer nonomer separated by 12 base pairs. So, one turn RSS and all the J gene segments have on their 5 prime side 2 turn RSS. Now, like I said it is a rule when joining takes place always a one turn RSS comes together with two turn RSS. Depicted here is slightly better for you to understand. You have the leader peptide sequence which now has the close to it on the 3 prime side V gene segment. Now, on the 3 prime side of the V gene segment you have one turn RSS whereas, on the 5 prime side of the J gene segment you have two turn RSS. Now, one red and one blue only these two can come together and join. This is the lambda light chain and this is the kappa light chain. Now, both of these are very similar to each other except I would like to mention here and which we will discover later kappa light chain has a little bit more variability than the lambda light chain. In mouse in fact 95 percent of the immunoglobulin gene associate with kappa light chain. Lambda and kappa light chain genes are present on different chromosomes. Chromosome 2 in human 6 in mouse has the lambda light chain, kappa light chain is present on chromosome 22 in human 16 in mouse and the heavy light chain gene is are present on chromosome 14 in human and 12 in mouse. Now, what I just discussed with you was dealing with the kappa light chain that you have 
one RSS and two RSS which join together. Now, what was in question is in case of the heavy gene, you have three gene segments. You have the V, D and J. So, how is one turn RSS and two turn RSS now contribute to allowing one of the J joining with any one of the D and any one of the V. So, when people sequence these genes closely and examine found that the D gene segment has RSS on both sides and the RSS are identical. Therefore, what I have shown here is the RSS in blue which would mean D has two turn RSS on both sides that is 3 prime side as well as 5 prime side. Now, the V and the J gene segments have on the 3 prime and 5 prime uh, respectively one turn RSS. Now, it is known it has been proved that first any one of the J on the heavy chain joins with any one of the D and once this is complete then recruit recruitment of any one of the V takes place. So, just to tell you again since heavy chain has 4 amino acids extra in the hypervariable region, people looked for another set of gene segments and found that it is the D segment D for diversity. This is therefore, this therefore makes the heavy chain gene slightly more complex than the light chain and we know by several studies later that the heavy chain contributes much more than the light chain in antigen binding. Now, how does this joining take place? This is quite a well coordinated and complex mechanism. Now, first of all both T and B cells only express an en set of enzymes called RAG1 and RAG2 recombination activated genes RAG and RAG2. We always tend to draw the DNA as straight lines, but we do know that these are quite looped you know the DNA loops out. The RAG1 and 2 recognize the RSS. Now, RSS the recognition signal sequences which are depicted in blue the heptamer and brown the nonamer. So, now what is shown in one is the DNA now which has the D segment which is going to join with the J segment. So, the D and the J come together which is a random process it could be any one of the D's 1 to 13 and any one of the J's 1 to 7. They come together because RAC 1 and 2 recognize these sequences bring them together. RAC 1 and 2 not only recognize the signal sequences, but they also nick the DNA on one strand and this is always at the joining of the coding strand and the RSS this is rather precise. So, recognition of the enzyme uh, sorry the DNA by the enzyme at the RSS nicking takes place on one strand. This generates a free hydroxyl radical which now attacks the opposite strand and cleaves the phosphodiesterase bond. The RAG 1 and 2 mediate recognition cleavage as well as now a trans esterification reaction which now makes a hairpin loop. Now, what I am shown here is what is happening on the side of the D strand. So, you have now first cleavage happening on one strand and then the second strand and the similar situation is on the strand which has the J gene segment. You have cleavage of the RSS or between the RSS and the coding strand 
and what do you have? Rag 1 and 2 mediated hairpin loop structure formation. Now, you would like to, so you can imagine that all this region, this entire region as well as this entire region now gets excised out and you have now the relevant D segment comes in close proximity to the J gene segment. Now, this hairpin structure that is formed is cleaved very specifically by an endonuclease which has been characterized rather recently known as Artemis. This enzyme that I said is an endonuclease does not recognize any sequence interestingly it recognizes this hairpin loop structure. The nicking takes place randomly and on both and you have now free or cut DNA. I will be dealing with the way these nucleotides are then uh, added by terminal deoxyribosyl transferase. Remember, this is one of the marker enzymes present on in B cells. Now, you have you can imagine C that variability would take place here because there is addition of nucleotides at the cut ends then you have ligation. Okay. So, this is where the cut ends there are additions of nucleotides and now you have double strand break repair enzymes which stitch the D and J together. Now, you can see very easily what are the different mechanisms that govern or that take place for this RSS recognition cleavage and finally, the 2 in this case 1 D and 1 J coming together. I would like to go back go over this once more. Let us see once again mechanism of DNA recombination you have recognition of the heptamer the one turn RSS separated by from the nonama. Now, this is recognized by the rag 1 and 2 of along with the another RSS which is a 2 turn RSS where the nonama and the heptamer are separated by 22 base pairs. Once these come together, then the enzyme nick one of the strands of DNA establishing a hydroxyl radical which then attacks the opposite strand bringing about a trans esterification reaction and making these hairpin structures. These hairpin structures in turn are recognized by specific endonucleases called Artemis, which can cut any part of the hairpin structure because neither the recognition nor the cutting is specific. These now generate open ends which are filled by DNA polymerases plus by addition of new nucleotides by the terminal deoxyribosyl transferase and then double strand break repair enzymes which stitch the DNA together. Now, the Q protein is not only specific for in B cells these could be present in several cells. So, recognition of signal sequences by recombinase machinery that is the rag 1 and 2 cleavage of one strand of DNA by rag 1 and 2 trans esterification reaction by rag 1 and 2 nicking of hairpin by endonuclease artemis trimming of nucleotides by exonucleases then nucleotide addition and repair by DSPR enzymes. Now, we know all this it is textbook knowledge nowadays, but how did people arrive at the 
presence of RSS and that recognition signal sequences are recognized by RAG 1 and 2 and then joining takes place. Now, I would like to tell you about this very elegant experiment that was carried out about 20 years ago. A retroviral construct was made where the construct had a promoter which was not in frame with the J gene segment with its RSS on the 3 prime side. Now, then followed the gene that conferred or confers resistance to a drug mycophenolic acid. Now, the gene is placed between J k RSS and V k RSS. Now, I just described earlier uh, the joining of D and J, but the same thing would happen in case of V and J as happens in the copper light chain. Now, the gene is placed in between these two such that only if recombination between these two takes place can the gene be in frame with the promoter and therefore, thereby get expressed. Now, this construct was transfected into test cells, I think they have taken fibroblasts and in the same fibroblasts they have also transfected the RAG 1 and 2 genes. Now, RAG 1 and 2 only when RAG 1 and 2 were also transfected and expressed in the cells that the cells became resistant to mycophenolic acid. This is a very simple experiment it would appear, but generation of this construct was what was difficult. Let us look at this a little bit closely. So, if RAG 1 and 2 in the cells were expressed they would bring about the same recognition and cleaving as I described earlier. This would then allow V and J to come together which would then allow the promoter to be in frame with the MPA resistance gene or let me put it the other way by inversional joining therefore, the MPA resistant gene would come in frame with the promoter and therefore, would get expressed. Only those cells that received now all cells receive the construct but only those cells that received also RAG 1 and 2 constructs and the protein was expressed did they become resistant to MPA or mycophenolic. Now, this was shown the same experiment was also utilized later to show the presence of TDT and associated with generation of diversity which I will come to later. Now, RAG 1 and 2 these two I told you are enzymes which are so specific and are absolutely required for generation of in fact generation of B and T cells. Defects in RAG 1 and 2 result in lack of T and B cells. There are set of mice a strain of mice called skid mice skid for severe combined immunodeficiency. Now, mutations in RAG 1 and 2 in these mice does not allow rearrangement of the immunoglobulin genes and if the immunoglobulin genes cannot be rearranged then there is there are no B cells made therefore, not only B cells also T cells. So, such mice lack the acquired arm of the immune system completely. Now, what are these RAG 1 and 2 just for interest these are a strange enough though they seem to be present in you know highly organized animals RAG 1 and 2 do not have any introns. So, they are primitive genes are these two related to each other no they are not homologous, but RAG 1 is weakly related to topoisomerases. You all might remember topoisomerases from your uh, DNA and um, molecular biology subjects these are they cut DNA. RAG 1 and 2 are single strand cutters they cut only 
single strand, but then the OH the hydroxyl group that is now generated is what attacks the opposite strand, but the enzymes themselves cut only single strands. Of course, they can cut only if they recognize and place themselves on that particular segment and this is through the ability to recognize the signal sequ sequences or recognition signal sequences. I talked about the heptama and the nonama are both of these essential for the generation of this recombination. Interestingly, though everybody looked for the palindrome or the heptama, it is the nonama that appears to be very important because elimination of this 9 mer of the RSS, the AT rich nonama decrease the binding of the RAC proteins by tenfold. So, absolutely essential both heptama and nonama are required for the recognition, but the affinity with which the enzyme is bind decreases a lot when the 9 mer is taken away. Now, I have come almost to the end of my talk, but I just like to now this is the final slide that shows what is the uh, what are the events or chain of events that take place for the formation of the entire immunoglobulin. Now, I have been talking about the light chain gene separately and the heavy chain gene separately. Let us look at what starts first. What I have not told you all that always the heavy chain assembly happens first. If you remember the ontogeny of the B cells, you know my first lecture that you have the progenitor B cell which is already committed to become B cell already starts expressing RAG 1 and 2 and therefore, at the level where they these progenitor cells come in contact with the stromal cells, they start now proliferation because of the interaction between interleukin 7 and interleukin 7 receptors, they already start now the recombination of the immunoglobulin genes at the heavy chain. Now, the heavy chain I told you starts with the combining of DH and JH. Now, the cell has choices if the DH and GH joining takes place, then the cell goes to would be called productive allele 1. Now, this after VH I mean sorry DH and GH join, then they recruit any one of the V and you have VDJ recombination that means the heavy chain which is already recombined and can be transcribed. In case this recombination cannot take place, then the cell has another chance on allele 2 for VDJ recombination. If this also does not take place, you do not have VDJ recombination, then the non productive allele even in the allele 2, then such cells undergo apoptosis. If on the other hand, if in the first instance like I said, if there is productive allele, then these cells go on to the light chain assembly and there also the sequences that of the two chains. Now, every, every chain, every gene would have two alleles of the two chains, the kappa light chain gene assembly takes place first, first allele 1 then allele 2 and then if the kappa light chain assembly also does not take place, then the cell chooses to allow rec the recombination happening in the lambda light chain allele 1 and then if not then allele 2. So, what you can see very clearly over here that you have productive alleles and non productive alleles. Now, because the cell can choose between well has a choice that if the first allele is non productive recombination starts with the second allele. Now, in case of the heavy chain you have 
non productive allele 1 and 2 such a cell would die. So, there is no question of the light chain reassembly taking place. However, should this either allele 1 or allele 2 become productive and you have VDJ recombination then it is possible that the cell can now try to recombine the kappa light chain gene allele 1 if not allele 2 and then has one more chance with the lambda light chain gene. Now, this is because of this highly regulated reorganization that is heavy chain first then the kappa then the lambda light chain one can see that the number of immunoglobulins that are associated with the lambda light chain are very few. In human it is much better than mouse there are 60 percent of the immunoglobulin genes which are associated with the kappa light chain and 40 with the lambda light chain. However, in mouse for some reason in fact, the lambda light chain gene is very constricted in the mouse even with respect to the variability. The light chain gene the lambda light chain gene constitutes only about 5 percent of the total immunoglobulins. Right? So, with this I will end here and my next class will be on the generation of diversity. So, far what have I talked about the mechanisms that go to combine the immunoglobulin genes such that the constant genes come in close proximity to the already combined hypervariable domain which constitute V D J in case of the heavy chain and V and J in case of the light chain. Now, once these are combined the genes are ready to transcribe and gets expressed on the cell surface. Later on in the ontogeny of the or development of the B cell when such B cells encounter an antigen they are able to secrete the very same immunoglobulin genes as antibodies. So, so far I, like I said that we have only talked about the organization of the immunoglobulin genes, but now what is most important is how do this organization alone help in generation of this tremendous diversity that we can see. Now, it was quite interesting to find that we have the set of genes corresponding to the V, D and J gene segments, the permutation combination that can take place in the heavy chain and the light chain and coming together of the heavy and light chain genes still could account for around a hundred million or sorry not hundred ten million different antigens, but we do know that the diversity that the immuno immune response can recognize is to the order of a hundred million. How does this happen? Now, apart from just the sequences that are present in this V D J gene segments, it was interesting that there is presence of a error prone polymerase in the memory cells which gives rise to this hypermutation. Now, why did I even think about talking about hypermutation is that of the two theories that were proposed in the beginning you know in the before 1960s one of the theory was germline and the other one was hypermutation. Now, the germline theory like I said was both the theories were actually rejected, but the germ, the second theory that is hypermutation said that immunoglobulins are identical from one B cell to another, but it is after the encounter with an antigen there is hypermutation of the immunoglobulin gene such that now there is a conformational change in the immunoglobulin hypervariable region inducing now a close fit with the antigen. Now, of course, the hypermutation that I am going to talk about in my next class is not this hypermutation that people thought about in the beginning, but there is an error, prone, error prone DNA polymerase which is capable of inducing small mutations in the variable region of the heavy chain and to some extent also the light chain which changes the affinity of the antigen binding to 
the receptor. So, the mutations are small, there are times when the mutations can bring about abrogation of binding with the antigen, but the immune system only regards those that bring about an increase in the affinity and therefore, we see a difference in the affinity in the second immune response to the same antigen as compared to the primary immune response. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.